I was sent this circuit breaker by a YouTuber called Zwift Racing and he said he did a couple of uh, circuit breakers fail in his panel and when they tripped, when you turned the back on again, they didn't seem to make a proper electrical connection. And initially I wondered if they'd been sat in incorrectly uh, to the uh, consumer unit because the way these uh, clamps work in some of these, you've got two positions for clamping. You can either clamp onto a sort of fork-shaped bus bar or you can clamp onto, a, a, well, a cable or the pin-shaped bus bar. And sometimes uh, people put these into consumer units and they don't actually make sure they're lined up and the actual pin goes up the back. And although this is tightened up, uh, it doesn't actually make a sound electrical connection. It's relying just on the pressure of the actual, the lid pushing it in to actually make that connection. But I don't see that's happening in this instance. It does look like the contacts have failed. And uh, when I got the circuit breaker, I noticed it was at Wilex NSB32. Now the NSB, some of the range in the Wilex uh, breakers was withdrawn. It was recalled. It happened, the recall happened on April 2010 and it's for breakers that were sold between April 2009 to February 2010. And it didn't just affect Wilex because a lot of the breakers are manufactured by the same company. It was a company called Electrum. And they sold these breakers under the brand names Wilex, Volex, and one version of the Crabtree breaker. I think it was the Lodestar. And they had a problem that the breakers were actually physically melting, that they were burning. They were actually going far and setting consumer units on fire. So they did a sort of rather speedy recall, although a lot of these breakers are still in position. Now, it's notable that the recall didn't cover the NSB32. It covered uh, other lower current ones in the range. I'm not sure what the final cause was. However, it I should say that uh, if Zwift Racing has watched this, I've tried contact him via the messages, but uh, if he's watching this then uh, and his distribution board is consuming it was put in back at that time, then it might be worth getting all the circuit breakers changed as a routine precaution if they are of that era. Uh, it also isn't helped by the fact that many of the consumer units were plastic consumer units, and this uh, incident may have contributed towards the Amendment 3 to the electrical regulations, which is uh, switching back to metal consumer units as they all used to be, because the plastic ones weren't a great idea. But it gives us a perfect opportunity to explore these circuit breakers and take a look at what uh, actually burned up inside. So here's a close-up of the circuit breaker, so you can see the bits in great detail, and I'll just walk through them. We have the uh, mains come in to uh, to the breaker from this side. I mean, technically speak, could come in either side, but in a distribution board, it would be coming in from that direction in the bottom. And that the first contact is this little plate here, and the second contact is this hook. And the reason it's a hook is because when it trips open, it forms part of an arc chute with this bit of metal here to actually deflect an arc up the way through these quenching plates. And there are two ways for the breaker to trip. One is a bimetallic strip because the current, when the contact's closed, the current flows through this solenoid, which is a very coarse solenoid, and then it goes up through this bimetallic strip. You can see the two layers. You can see the copper on one side. Well, I think it's copper, and the other metal could be steel. I'm not really sure what that alloy will be. And it goes up to the other terminal, which is sort of clamped in fairly tightly, and then it's got an adjustment screw here, which is used to fine-tune the bimetallic strip. Now, the trip plate in this is a little plastic cream or clear, is it clear or cream? It's kind of off white clear plastic. And it uh, disengages this little metal pole here with the mechanism. And what this means is that when you actually trip the breaker, even if you hold the switch in the on position, you can't stop it from tripping. When it trips, it will still trip the contact. And I'll show you that afterwards in greater detail. We can zoom in on this and take a look. So that's, uh, the bimetallic mechanism is used for slow overloads. This is a 32 amp breaker. If it was overloaded with, say, 40 amps, then it wouldn't trip instantly. It would gradually heat this bimetallic strip, and the, more, the higher the current, the faster it would heat it. And gradually that little tongue there would come up until it hit the trip mechanism. The other trip mechanism for really high current overloads, basically dead shorts, is the instantaneous trip. It's the solenoid here. And what happens when the current is high enough is that this metal pin comes up and it doesn't just 
at this end hit the trip lever, but also this little bit catches on the contact and accelerates it. It just actually snatches it away that little bit faster just for uh, extra fast braking of the arc for safety. Um, the type of breaker now, this is a type B, and the type, I'm guessing, will just vary the number of uh, turns. It won't just be related to the, the diameter won't just be related to the current, it'll be related to the trip threshold, the instant trip threshold. And you get type A, which is a, quite a low instant trip threshold, type B, which is normal, this is a type B. Type C, which is designed to handle inrush currents like um, transformers and things like that. And then type D, which is the worst case, it's for a heavy industrial plant like big welders and stuff like that, where there's a really massive inrush current. And it takes, you have to apply a multiplier to the uh, rating to determine what current it's going to trip at instantly. And you have to uh, make sure that the circuit is actually going to be able to support that fault current to ensure it does trip instantly. Um, let's take a closer look, break, look at the breaker. And for this, you know what, it might be easier just to zoom in. So I will zoom in. Let's uh, see how close we can get. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? So here's the breaker. It looks like it's in focus. So to reset it, I'm just going to push this toggle up and it locks in position. Now, the important thing to note here is that the actual mechanism that's uh, moving the contact is this metal arm here. And it's got a spring-loaded connection to that, so even when it's actually... When the contact is made, that arm is still moving a bit and it's putting pressure against the contact. And quite oddly, the contact in this case is a little square of that material uh, and just basically this hook-shaped contact that presses against it. And the trip mechanism, when it uh, trips and this little plastic catch toggle gets triggered, if I hold it up deliberately, so it's tripped even though I was holding it up, the bit that actually trips is a small sort of pull mechanism. You can see it's sort of wobbling here. And that's the bit that latches into that. So when I let that go down, and then sometimes you have to push it down a little bit to actually make it click in, that's the point it then latches and pulls that back. But when it actually trips, the it's not just knocking this back. It is actually detaching that pull from the contact spring. And then by nature, the... Uh, dolly of the circuit breaker is then kind of, it's by default returns to the, the bottom if it can. So let's uh, trip that uh, thermally, well, pseudo-thermally, I'm just going to trip it manually, by pushing up that bimetallic strip. So here's a bimetallic strip, there's a little catch that's going to pull on this little sort of off-clear uh, lever, so I'm going to push that up and it goes up quite a distance before it hits it. And that trips it. The other tripping mechanism is the solenoid, so I'll reset it again. And there's the solenoid plunger down here. And it's going to go up until it hits that, and then it trips it as well. So let's take this to bits further. Let's remove the arc chute. I should also mention that when the case is assembled, there are ceramic uh, inserts in here that will uh, protect the plastic case from the arc in there. And then, of course, once the arc comes up here, it's got a metal, the metal runners and then the copper plates to actually break the arc. So let's lift this out. If it'll come out. Will it come out? Everything's coming out but it. Oop. No, it's quite hard to get out. Mm. There we go. So this is just a series of copper fins. And as the arc goes into that, it has a sort of cooling effect, I guess, really. And any uh, gas that, well, any sort of hot air, any expansion of gases goes up through these slots here. And they're vented out the back of the unit initially into this area and then through a port at the back, just so that it doesn't come out the front of the unit. Everything is really, it's just falling apart. Hopefully that was in shock, forgetting that I'm zoomed in so far. So this is one of the arc shoots. It's where the arc will go up. And I have to say, there are signs that an arc has travelled up that. It looks like it has broken a modest fault current. And the other one, it, oh, let's say, while well, we've got that out, there's the little bit of contact material. And it is pitted. It's quite rough from what it's been exposed to, the faults. Um, the other uh, shoot is that little copper strip there that when the... Uh, 
contact comes up, that curved contact, you can see actually that the arc has curled round that and then it's gone up that. You can see a slight pitting. It has definitely gone up there, which is kind of interesting. I wonder what drives that up there, because keep in mind that these circuit boards, I would have thought it would be circuit breakers. I would have thought that because it's mounted vertically, that's what would carry the arc up the way. But keep in mind that you also get these mounted horizontally in uh, the set of industrial uh, breaker panels as well. And it makes me wonder, why would the arc actually want to open up? I, I suppose it's a bit like the Jacob's Ladder, maybe the expanding air, probably... Uh, and the ionised air probably just makes it an easier, more conductive path. Although you'd have thought it would actually just want to hover around here. Odd. Uh, and that's fundamentally it. When you look at different breakers with higher current ratings, you see the larger uh, windings. And likewise, the lower current ratings, you'll see much finer windings around the, the uh, solenoid. And I'm guessing ultimately that the number of turns will also depend on that instant trip current. But it's quite interesting. That's not going to come out too easily, but let's uh, take a closer look at this mechanism. So when that's up in position, he said, putting the solenoid in, uh, and that trips. It's that just that little catch there that holds it in place, but what makes the thing latch up in, in the first place? It has this little uh, link, plastic link here, that when it's pushed into the on position, that goes down just beyond vertical with reference to the, just beyond the line of, uh, between its pivot there and the pivot there, and that'll be what latches the dolly in position. But what makes it uh, release when it's a, uh, oh, I think that gives it a push, that's what actually makes it release. It gives that uh, lever a slight bias to actually push that over and uh, turn it off. Well, actually flip the lever down because the, the contact is already uh, cleared and f flipped up out of the position. But it's quite interesting. These things are mass produced. I mean, I can buy these at standard models for between two, three, four pounds. And you think it, they're so complex and these things are rated to break. Well, what is this one rated to break? This one is rated to break up to 6,000 amps under fault conditions. That's quite severe. It's a lot of current. Um... But yeah, they're ingenious. There's a lot in them, but ultimately, I guess it's just mass production that is what makes them so affordable. They're pretty neat. And so many of them are, they look pretty similar inside. I get the feeling that after someone has evolved the design, other manufacturers may have based theirs on similar sort of styles. Oh, it's worth mentioning. Uh, I'll zoom back out again here. It's worth mentioning that uh, other brands have been affected by forgeries, copies, and I think it was Schneider, may have been affected by some clones of their breakers. They looked apart on the outside, but inside there was none of this trip mechanism at all. It was just a contact and then a, a, just the braided copper wire going up. They didn't have any trip characteristic. Well, they didn't have any tripping facility at all. They would just have gone bang in the event of a fault. Uh, Square D, they also had forgeries uh, of their breakers. So if you're buying circuit breakers, I recommend going to prominent suppliers for them and don't, bu don't buy the stuff off eBay uh, from places like China because it, you just don't know how it's going to perform uh, in the event of a fault. And when a fault occurs, it can be quite destructive with uh, the amount of current that flows. But this was interesting. It was actually really nice to actually open a circuit breaker and take a look at the mechanism and see how it all worked.